Jeremiah 29, we're going to read here starting in verse 8. We don't usually read verse 8. We, where do we like to start? Verse 11, we like that one. It's a feel-good scripture. We're going to get sort of a running start into this one. Verse 8. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. That's how you start a sentence right there. Full government. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. So it starts off that, that feel good scripture you guys love so much, Jeremiah 29 11, the opening to it is a rebuke on all the people. Stop listening to those false teachers out there. And what does he say about the false teachers? Why are they prophesying false things? It says, that stop listening to the false teachings that you encourage them to teach you. She says, you can't just blame the false teachers out there. You can't just say, oh, all these false teachers out there. Can you believe it? It's ridiculous. You guys eat it up. And that's why there's so much of it. You know, many of us uh, at a time were faithful to the YouTube ministry. We were real big on the, the Instagram Reels ministry or the TikTok ministry. And like the extent of your spiritual consumption was like a, some spiritual guru. It's just some dude in a snapback with a tripod with some cheap podcast equipment. And he just says one or two things. You're like, that resonates. That's going on the story right there. Sure. And, and that was it. That was the whole scope. And there's nothing like necessarily wrong with virtual media. Like, you know, we got a camera. It's going on YouTube. Shout out Alicia and Ashley and the whole media team. But there's nothing inherently wrong with it. But the problem is that today it's so oversaturated. You can get so many different kinds of flavors of Christianity. You know, as a generation, we like different kinds of flavors. Some of us are more like vanilla people. Maybe a little Joel Olstein. A little, a little Billy Graham, if you know what I mean. Some people prefer chocolate. A little T.D. Jakes in there. Can, can, I, can I get a Mike Todd sermon? Can I get a little, uh, a little clip of that right there? And there's literally any different like, kind of Christianity that you want out there. You know, capitalism is predicated on the idea that if enough people want something, someone's going to come along and sell it to you. And religion is a big business. We're a menu generation. What's that mean? I don't just want my food. I want my food the way that I want it. Oh, uh, the number one, number two, number three are not enough. When's the last time you went to a Wendy's? There's like a, a number 37 on there. There's so many different kinds of things. And, and not, not, I don't just want like specific things. I want it cheap. And I want options with my cheap options. So I want a four for four. And there's got to be 16 different things. And I can assign them and four different things and $1 per thing. And then I want the $5 biggie bag as well. And I want this. I want the dollar menu. And, and it was just such a menu generation. We can't buy things unless we know that we can take it back and get our money back if we don't like it. Amazon. Like uh, how, who has like returned an Amazon order in like the last hour probably all of you guys have I, I like it i try i'm not sure if i want i was talking to a brother recently and he's like yeah i want to do some uh i need some stuff from amazon so i'm going to buy it and then i'm going to use it for the thing that i'm buying it for and then i'm just going to like send it back and get my money back and that's like a real thing you can do this is a strategy and we like that with our religion as well i i, I want a religion I, I like the part that like appeals to my spiritual elitism so there needs to be some kind of hard lineness in there because it makes me feel like i'm actually doing more than everybody else but I don't want the accountability part, though. I just want to pretend like I'm doing it. I don't want anyone to ask me if I'm actually doing it. Other people, it's like, I want a religion that, like, agrees with me politically. And we got to get, like, political up in here. And other people are like, I want a religion where there's no politics in it whatsoever. And if it gets political, like, I'm going to really freak out right now. And other people, it's about, like, the sexuality stuff. And other people, it's about, like, everyone needs to look like me. If everyone doesn't look like me, I might actually start freaking out. i got to find a church of people that look like me. Other people, it's just too much. It's just, it's just too much to actually go to church on a Sunday. I can go on an Easter. I can go on Christmas. But, man, it's just so nice in my pajamas. I'm on Zoom. Some of us miss the Zoom days. No one told me I got to go to anything. I can roll out of bed 9.59, log in, camera off, camera on by like 10.11. That's so soon enough. No one's going to text me about it. If it's 10.12, if it's someone might text me about it. But 10.11, I can get away with that. I've got it down to a science. So I can be as lazy as possible and still present myself as someone who's doing their best. And here, this goes back thousands of years. And Jeremiah says, you just got to stop not just listening to it. You got to stop craving it. You got to stop wanting false teaching. And then it gets into the feel-good scripture in verse 10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. 
Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your hearts. Here it's an incredible scripture. And he tells them this great promise that he has for them, and it's standing, it lasts for all time. But specifically here, what is the lie that he was warning his people to not buy into? What does he clarify? Did you guys catch it? What does he say in verse 10? He says, you're going to go into exile for 70 years. Now, in chapter 28, there was a false prophet named Hananiah who said, guys, we are going to go into exile, but it's only going to be two years. We're going to go into exile for two years, and then God's going to bring us back into the land. And Jeremiah says, you got to stop listening to that guy. He's lying to you. God said it's going to be 70 years in exile. So what is that feel-good scripture that you like to put on your on your Instagram bio and you write it on your shoes and you you know you have it on your tattoo? What is it actually talking about? Slavery for 70 years. That's the meaning of the passage. And so why are the people believing these lies? They don't want to accept that there's going to be hardship and there's going to be challenge in their life. You know, I think that he also adds a qualifier here. What does he say that the people have to do on their end? Yeah, he doesn't just say, I'm just going to bring you back regardless. He says, I will bring you back if, when, you seek me with all of your heart. What does all your heart mean? It means you're trying your very best. It means you're doing everything you can to live according to the way God wants you to live. You know, I think a lot of people, they, they, they don't like that God puts the ball in their courts. But he totally does. It's totally up to you. Are you going to seek God with all your heart? Instead, people wake up and they're just expecting the supernatural, irresistible grace to just fall from the clouds and land on them. And like, I, I, I'm just so motivated all of a sudden. I can't just help but be a disciple and deny myself and not sin anymore. And that's never going to happen. And if you wake up in the morning and you're like, well, I don't really feel from within me that I want to deny myself every day and stop sinning and give my heart. So it must not be my time to be a disciple. Maybe tomorrow I'll wake up with just this sudden burning passion inside of me. And maybe then, maybe then I'll actually get up and do it. And, and it must not be my time. I got to trust God on this. I got to trust God's timing. And certainly God's timing will be revealed to me when I just have this irresistible urge to just deny myself of all my sin and suddenly live like a good person. But it's never going to happen. The ball is totally in your court. The question is never, is God going to choose you? The question is always, when are you going to choose God? Over your own life, your own desires, and your own physical temptations. You know, I think people miss God's plan because they don't see God with all their hearts. See, God has a plan for your life. The life you're living may not be God's plan for you. Because you guys know this. You can write a plan for somebody, but if they don't follow the plan, are the results of the plan going to be apparent in their life? So I believe fundamentally everyone has two routes they can take in their life. The path that God has paid for them, or you can make your own, for better or worse. I think God already knows what he wants your life to look like. He's outside of time. I think he knows what your spouse looks like. He knows if he's handsome or not. And if you'll get your heart behind it. He knows what your kids are going to look like. He knows what your career is going to turn out to be. He knows all the people you're going to reach out to and bring into the kingdom one day. And he's got it all planned out for you. But if you don't walk down that path, can you still expect to receive the things that were promised for you on that path? So a lot of people are like, man, God promised me. He said he had good things in store for me. I just don't understand why they're not in my life. Well, the thing is they're behind that door and you didn't walk through that door. You chose curtain number one. You're mad you don't have what's behind curtain number two. See, it's always back to what are we going to do? How are we going to respond to what the scriptures say we need to do? And I think the main reason why, like, why do you guys think they chose the Hananiah's prophecy over Jeremiah's? Why do you think they preferred that one? They don't want to go into exile. They don't want to go through the hardship. What was exile going to look like for them? It meant the Babylonians were going to come and they were going to kill a lot of them. And those who would survive, they were going to put a hook through their jaw and they're going to drag them across the desert and make them be slaves and servants in Babylon. You can maybe can understand why people weren't looking forward to this. You know, Christianity is a radical teaching. Because as you saw, like one of the major themes that all these people came up here and shared, what was like the thing that really stood out to them? Suffering. That's a funny word, right? And not to make light of anyone's challenges, but most of us know nothing about suffering. When you talk about suffering in the Bible, usually it's referring to the sacrifice that Jesus made. Rod iron nails through your arms. 
feet pressed over each other, nailed right through it, naked, bleeding, right in front of your own mom, as all your friends abandon you. That's the Bible's definition of suffering. Now, we go through challenges, and we get overwhelmed, and we have a hard time, absolutely. But Christianity is all about embracing it. See, very few religions are like that. You know, as someone talked about Buddhism, Buddhism is all about not facing your pain. Pain is evil, so we must find a way to escape it. Christianity is all about pain is the only solution. You have to learn how to deal with it in a spiritual way. And then I love the part where it says prosper. A lot of people look at prosper, and you guys think that means like wealth. Like the Bible says I'm a prosper, where my money at? You think prosper means like a husband that can't take his eyes off of you? You think prosper means like a wife that just does whatever you say? Like, like when, when is God going to let me prosper? Prosper is not wealth. It's not about comfort. It has nothing to do with your five-year plan. Prosper in this situation, in this context, is about helping you to actually achieve the expectation that God has put in your life. So for us in the New Covenant, what is the expectation that God has put onto our lives? To not just be faithful, but to be fruitful. So what is the promise here? If you give your whole heart and you don't give up and you embrace the challenges, you'll be successful in being fruitful, helping other people to become disciples. And that might shatter your idea of Christianity. I thought that if I'm a good boy, Santa's going to come to town and I'm going to get presents. I thought that was Christianity. But this uh, Christianity and Christmas are like not the same thing at all. Jesus is not Santa. He brings coal every single time and he throws them at you. <laughs> And you're supposed to bring him cookies and milk. And he, and he eats it and drinks it. And there are no presents for you. Instead, it's all about helping you develop what? Character. Let's talk about how to build character. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5. Let's start here. Think in verse 3. Yeah, verse 3. It says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. That's just a psycho thing to say. I actually don't know what that means. I'll ask Shauna later. Maybe she can explain it to me. Glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So here we learn how we get character. What is it? Ah, oh, you see, you guys know this one already. See, a lot of people think suffering. If I suffer, I'll have character. That's actually not true. Suffering provides the opportunity to persevere. And if you persevere, then character will be the result. You know, you can go through a lot of suffering and like learn nothing from that. You can. Su In fact, maybe sometimes the reason why we're still suffering is because we still just have not learned the lesson. We have not learned how to persevere. If you're suffering in your sobriety, and so you decide to numb out with a little alcohol, did you persevere? If you're suffering in your celibacy and your abstinence and you decide just to give yourself a little break with a little immorality, did you persevere? No, in no way whatsoever. Therefore, you have not developed character. And for a lot of us, we come into the kingdom and we think we're like high character people. We read the scripture about the talents, like five talent person. You're like, ah, that's me. Yeah. Like I, got, I have no choice. I got to get in there and really give it all to God. I mean... I'm a high character person and you come in the kingdom and what becomes like glaringly obvious to you very soon is you actually have no character a lot of us come in the kingdom with like a deficit of character you have negative character if it was on a scale it's below zero and it gets exposed in all these different ways I think one way that character is exposed is you, you, you start to realize in the kingdom you actually can't show up on time to things and people talk about it like they're a victim of this so they're like yeah, I just I just really struggle with showing up on time to things, and it's almost chronic at this point. And you talk about it as if it's something that happens to you, as opposed to, like, it's something that you did. Like, you are the culprit. The wanted sign has your face on it. You're the, like, you're the one who shows up late every time. And then you try to, like, make yourself feel better. It's not a character thing. It's not a character thing. It's, what is it? It's totally a character thing if you can't figure out how to show up places on time. You know, I was talking to one, uh, one sister, one girl who's trying to come to church, and she's like, yeah, just, just please pray for me. I really want to come to church on Sunday. Just please pray for me that I, that I get up on time and so I can come to church. And I was like, I don't think that's like what I should pray for here. Like, this, you, you, why would you pray for something that you can literally do? <laughs> like, like, God doesn't need to help you to get, get up on time. Like, I'll show you how I do it. I set the alarm clock, <laughs> and then when it goes off, you get up. And she's like, I do that, but like when the alarm clock goes off, I just, 
I just turn it off and I go back to sleep. So please pray for me that I don't do that. I was like, I don't think, once again, I'm not going to pray for that, actually. I think you need to decide that when the alarm goes off, you're going to press it, and then you're going to get up. I was talking to another brother. He's like, yeah, my alarm goes off, and, and I get up, and then you know, I go as fast as I can. I just still show up late. I don't know what's going on. Well, what time do you set the alarm for? 9.15. I said, for 9.15. How far away do you live? Uh, like 30 minutes. I have a radical idea for you. Get up a little sooner, and then you'll have more time, and then you can make it to church on time. <laughs> And I think for a lot of people, they show up late and they have no understanding of how disrespectful that is because they don't take responsibility for anything in their life. I mean, just imagine for a second you're hosting a birthday party for grandma and grandma's turning 90 and she hasn't seen the grandkids in a long time. And, and, and you just, you love grandma. So you're busting out all the stops. You buy balloons on Amazon. You're not even going to return them. Like you're you're going you're gonna to have the balloons. And, and then you do this like really thoughtful thing that like relates to these inside things within your family. And you got it all going. And then and you call cousin. Cousin's like, I'm going to be there. And you call dad. Dad's like, I'm coming. And you call mom. Like, mom, it would just mean the world to grandma if you would come, mom. I'm really trying to make it awesome for grandma. Mom's like, ah, I got all these things. But you know what? I'm going to be there. And then brother's like, I'll be there too. Sister says, I'll come and I'll bring a gift. It's going to be great. And then the night before, cousin says, ah, I'm not going to be able to be there. Like my cat is sick. And I, I just can't be there because my cat is sick. And I'm so sorry. And then, and then dad calls you. He's like, yeah, I just, I've just already decided now that I'm going to be really tired tomorrow morning. So I'm not going to be there. And now dad and cousin are not going to be there. And the event starts at 10. And now it's 10. And grandma's like, oh, I can't wait to see the babies. And then it's 10.05. And then it's 10.10. And then it's 10.15. And now what is your conclusion about the family? They don't care about grandma. And this is the funny thing. Ask each of them individually. Do you love grandma? What do they all say? I love grandma. Say, you don't love grandma. What do they say? How dare you? You don't know my heart. You don't know me. Are you judging me? Here's the thing. Your whole love for grandma actually has nothing to do with grandma at this point. All it is is your way to self-validate and convince yourself you're a good person because you just can't stand the idea that you're not actually good to grandma at all. You've never been there for her. You've never cared what she wants. It's always been about you. It's always been about your schedule. And you don't care about grandma at all at this point. And yet we say, I love God. God is my everything. I got a tattoo. That's serious. I also have a tattoo of a deck of cards on this arm, but that's not the point. I, that's serious. I love God. I love him so much. I read a scripture today, John 3, 16. I read it every day. I just can't get enough of it. Sometimes I read Romans 10, 9 also. And those are my two verses. They're my anchor scriptures, if you know what I'm saying. They anchor me. They anchor me. It's so heavy, I can't even get out of bed. It's like such a strong anchor. It just keeps me in place. God forbid I drift to church on time. So I got to really anchor myself with these power verses. And when you start to realize, this is a character issue. <laughs> you can't get to places on time. It's because you don't have character. You know, I think sometimes we start to struggle in other areas. And, and God just starts to show us by being in the kingdom, you have no character. You start to realize that your character is so low, you can't read. You can't read a book. Why? Because you're supposed to read your Bible every day. And then you start to realize like, wow, like reading consistently is kind of beyond my ability here. Because what's the challenge? Read a chapter every day. How long is a chapter? It's like an Instagram post worth of words. You can put more words in like a, a post than you like in a chapter. It's like not that long. It literally takes like a minute to read. Like speed read a chapter. Watch how fast that goes by. And, and like read a chapter every day. Hey, did you read a chapter yesterday? Oh, no, I didn't actually. That's crazy. I've never read it. And then the idea of like reading the whole Bible comes in front of you. And you're like, read the whole Bible. It's never even occurred to you that's something that you should do. Imagine now, grandma writes you a letter. <laughs> she puts all her work into the letter. The, le the, the process of writing the letter is so demanding for grandma that she actually dies as a result of penning the letter. Like with her last heartbeat, she signs that letter. Love grandma. And she dies. And the letter is carried to you by a deliverer who gets like murdered on his way to you. And then someone else picks up the letter and says, I won't let this be in vain. I'm doing it for grandma. And then they get killed on their way to you. And there's a series of people getting killed over centuries. 
and then a messenger brings you the letter. What would be like the greatest crime of humanity? Not read it. To open it up and read like the first line. Dear, oh, it's my name. I think that's enough for today. <laughs> Tomorrow, you know, I love that one so much. I'm reading it. I just can't get enough of it. I, I, I think I might write that one on my shoe when I play basketball or something. I just, I, I just feel so silly inside when I read this. It just, it's like the butterflies are in here or something, and you've never read the letter. You have no idea what grandma's heart was to read it. You're so out of touch with what's been given to you. You are so disconnected with the importance of the personalization of the Bible in your life. Wow. And then someone says, like, hey, I think you should read the whole Bible. And you actually get, like, offended at that. You're like, are you telling me, like, well, I'm not doing good enough? Is it, nothing's ever enough for you people, is it? I just feel like it's just so demanding all the time. You're telling me to read the whole Bible. You guys know if you were to read 30 minutes a day, you'd be done in a year? Isn't that crazy? 15, no, 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 I'm off on that. 30 minutes a day, you're done in six months. 15 minutes a day, you're done in a year. 15 minutes a day. And yet... Man, a lot of us, like, so think about that. Okay, so seven minutes a day, you finish in what, two years? Three and a half minutes a day, how long are you going to finish? Four years, right? So to finish the Bible in 10 years, what would that be? Probably like seconds of reading per day. <laughs> That's if you read at like a fourth grade reading level. A lot of us are that old at least times two. And yet you've never read the Bible. And at some point, like, you have to realize, wow, my character is being stretched. I actually can't read. And it's a radical conviction to come to. Imagine for a second you're part of a book club, like Harry Potter Club. And every Sunday you have, like, book club meeting. And then also on Wednesday you have book club meeting. And on Friday you have, like, an activity-based but Harry Potter-themed event all about Harry Potter. And you're coming to all these meetings, and in one of the meetings someone's like, have you ever read the book? Because we're talking about this character in the book, and it doesn't seem like you know who we're talking about. Like, that would be pretty absurd at a certain point, right? Like, you're a part of Harry Potter Club, but you've just never read Harry Potter. And someone's like, like do you, are you really into this, man? Because, like, we're all pretty serious about Harry Potter, and you don't know who Harry Potter is. Like, you, you know, like, maybe two or three characters at best. Like, this is, like, pretty common stuff. And then you're, like, super offended. Like, how dare you question my allegiance to Harry Potter? I love Harry Potter. I got, like, a replica wand in my room and all this stuff like that. Like, what does that have to do with reading the book, though? But if you actually are going to call yourself a Christian, at what point do you hold yourself to the standard of, I'm going to read the Bible too? So the kingdom, man, it exposes our ability in all these things. I think conflict resolution is another one. Man, you come in the kingdom and you realize you've actually never resolved a conflict in your life. You just ghosted people and then slandered people behind their back and avoided people or got passive aggressive with people. And so you come in the kingdom and someone tries to resolve conflict with you. Doesn't it feel like they're attacking you a little bit? It's actually super jarring. And they come to you and they're like, hey, hey, like, are, are you feeling okay? And you're like, I'm fine. Fine. It doesn't seem like you're fine. Well, I was fine. And then you asked me if I'm upset. And like, now I'm upset. <laughs> if me asking you if you're upset is enough to make you upset, then I still think you have a problem. And I can probably help you with that. Maybe we can look at some scriptures. Like, can you imagine if, like, Jesus treated people that way? Wouldn't that hurt your heart? Wouldn't it hurt your heart if, like, Peter was like, Jesus, like, are you feeling okay? And Jesus like, fine, dude. Like, she's always bothering me and stuff like that. Like, I'd be heartbroken if I watched, like, a, a, a playback of Jesus acting like that. And we know that Jesus would never treat people like that. So why do we feel totally justified to treat everyone that we ever interact with like that? Just cold-shouldering people. Because so we don't have the character to actually resolve conflict and deal with confrontation with other people in our life. Another thing that the kingdom will expose in you, you don't have the character to pay attention to things. And then you try to pray. And you start praying and, like... You, you know, you're like, I'm a beast at prayer. I do it all the time. I go, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. A few Hail Marys. Boom, that's prayer. No. Now, when you're praying at, like, at, the, at the most bare bones level, what is happening? You're communicating with God. You're talking with God. That's prayer. So imagine if, if it, was, it was like this in any other relationship. Like, so imagine if you had a roommate. And every time your roommate comes home, he's like, dearest roommate. <laughs> hallowed be thy name in the dorm as it is back home may our chores be done may our daily rent be given to us you'd be like wow that's a weird thing I don't really know why you just said that to me <laughs> and imagine that's like all they say to you and they just totally ignore you outside of that and then like just totally, totally randomly middle of the night he's like give me money and you're like good, good morning like, nice to hear from you I haven't heard from you in a while and then he's just like quiet after that. And then he comes to you just like, I'm so upset. Like my best friend is not my best friend anymore. 
but I don't have any other friends, so I can't tell my best friend that we're not best friends anymore, so we're gonna like be pretend best friends until I have a new best friend, then I'm dropping that best friend, I get my new best friend. And you're like, what are you talking about? And you'd be so freaked out by this person. I think God is freaked out by some of you guys, actually. Because you come to God like on the regular, like, how would be that name? That kingdom come. And, and God's like, you know, I, I felt that when Jesus said it to me. It's not hitting the same from you, though. I don't even know what you're talking about, actually. It's kind of freaking me out. And then, like, you totally ignore God. You live your life as if he doesn't exist. Until, like, you know, the, the, the credit card balance is a little high. Like, <laughs> Stephanie's great with finances. It's not personal. This is actually in my notes. But the balance is a little high because you swiped it and you paid for things that you can't afford. And now you're freaking out. Like, God, if you could just bail me out from this one, I swear I'll never swear to anything ever again. And, like, the turbulence gets a little crazy. And you're like, God, if you could just get us there safely, then I, I swear I'll stop. I'll stop treating you like a loan shark and making promises with you. Just, just get me on this thing safely. And then your friends convince you to go to Six Flags. You're going up the roller coaster. You're like, this is a little higher from up here than it looks when I was down there. And I'm getting a little, God, if you just get me out of this situation. And God's like, nice to hear from you. I guess I'm going to talk to you. I just have to put you in a life-endangering situation where you're actually in no danger, but you're just super anxious as a person, probably because you never talk to me and never pray to me. No wonder you're so freaked out all the time. It'd be nice to know you a little bit. And the reason why we don't pray is because we just don't have the attention span for it. And you sit there and you're like, thank you, God, for dad. Thank you, God, for mom. Thank you, God, for my... Oh, that basketball run the other day was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I should post it on Facebook. Oh my God, I'm praying, I'm praying. And God, just thank you for the... That really handsome guy I went on a date with at the conference. He's, he's like, Maybe I should... That won't be too forward. Oh, I'm praying. I'm praying. And you just have like a tension, character, spiritual deficit disorder. It's your diagnosis. And, and then you realize like, like, here's a fun challenge. Pray for an hour straight and don't ask for anything. And don't get distracted at any point. Watch how you do. Time yourself. Try to beat your record of like three and a half minutes. And, and you're going to realize like, wow, I don't have any character at all. I can't resolve conflict. I can't read. I can't pay attention to things. And here's the incredible thing. God is so giving. He's going to give you so much opportunity to grow your character. And what is the only environment in which you can grow your character? Suffering. 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 And so a lot of us are like, why does God do this to us? Because he wants you to go to heaven. And God doesn't want people in heaven that can't read, that can't pay attention, that can't resolve conflict with each other, that don't care about him at all, that wouldn't show up to grandma's birthday on time. So he's going to put you through enough hardship so you have the opportunity to persevere so you can develop the character that it takes to run the Christian race so that we can be in heaven with him one day. Come on. Let's go to uh, Acts chapter 8. More about what it looks like to see God with all your heart and to give everything you have. Acts chapter 8. You know, in Job, there's a great verse that says, Beware of turning to evil which you seem to prefer to affliction. And that's all it is, is why would I embrace the hardship of abstinence, of sobriety, of paying attention, of learning how to read, when I can just bring sin into my life instead? And God says, beware of it. Why? Because the temptation is always going to come at you. It will always come at you. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. I don't care how long you've been doing this thing. Always, we must be aware. Beware. Be aware of not turning to evil in response to affliction in our life. Well, Acts chapter 8, let's read a story about seeking God with all your heart. So it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. Uh, shout out to all the queens out there. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told him, told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. So sort of a funny situation here. So it starts off with an angel, and an angel goes to Philip and says, go to the desert. That's it. That's all he tells him. Like, go into the desert road. So Philip just does it. 
and he wanders into the desert. Can you imagine that? Like imagine an angel came to you right now and said, hey, book a one way to Afghanistan. Nice. No questions. Okay. Expedia. I'm going to Afghanistan. Philip, and we learn later Philip has a family. He has five daughters. So for people that are like, oh, I got a lot of responsibility, Philip went to the desert. <laughs> and he goes, and then he finds this guy. He says he's an Ethiopian eunuch. He's the treasurer of his country. It says he was in a chariot, and he's on his way home after going to Jerusalem to worship. So a few things here. He's from Ethiopia. He went to Jerusalem to worship, to go to church. Uh, any idea how long it might take to get from Ethiopia to Jerusalem when your method of travel is by chariot? Yeah, you guys are cheating. You've heard this before. Yeah, it, no, you actually know the real answer. Yeah, it, it takes about three months there and three months back. So this guy takes six months off of work to go to church. A lot of people are like, where's your church? 30 minutes away? No, it's too far. This guy's like, six months away? Okay, I'll be there. I'll, I'll, I'll go to church. So three months going to church. Now he's coming back, and now the angel reappears to Philip. So this whole time, Philip's been like in the desert chilling. And sometimes the way the Bible's written, we can think that like only a few minutes have gone by. We don't know that. We don't know how long Philip is just in the desert, just waiting for his next order. It doesn't take long to be in the desert to start looking like a guy who's been in the desert for a while. So, I mean, I'm in the desert for like five and a half minutes. And I'm, I'm sunburnt. I look about as pink as Blake, probably. I got like, he probably got sand in his beard. He looking a little dusty. You don't take long to get dusty looking when you're in the desert. And now the angel comes to him and gives him these dynamic directions of run to that chariot. And Philip's two for two. He just starts sprinting head on at the chariot. So now imagine you're this treasurer. You're like reading the Bible. He says, reading Isaiah the prophet. You're on your way home. You're in the desert. And there's just a stranger just booking it at you, sprinting at you. And he, cut, and he like hits the brakes right in front of the chariot. Like imagine just running in front of a car. And he's like, do you understand what you're reading? Let's see what he says. Verse 31. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. It's pretty incredible. So you have this total stranger, probably looks like very disheveled, little sunburn, sand all over him runs up to this royal official who's in a chariot. Anyone ever had a chariot before? I've never seen that. That's, that's kind of, that's a cool ride. He's in a chariot. He's got servants with him. He's trying to figure out the Bible and some just total stranger. Probably looks crazy. Do you understand what you're reading? And how does this guy respond? No Honestly, no. You, you ever feel like that when you read the Old Testament? Yeah. Nebu, Chad, ne Nezer, Nebu. I'm just going to read John 3.16 today. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Back to my old bread and butter. And he's trying to read it, and he can't understand it. And this totally random guy in the desert is like, I can help you with that. And so he invites Philip into the chariot with him, just brings this crazy looking guy into his car, into his chariot. And then he says, he starts telling him about Jesus. And then what do they come across? Water. They're in a desert. What's like the one characteristic of a desert? There's no water in that place. What does this mean? God provided the water. And he says, what can stand in my way? of getting baptized. In other words, nothing's going to stop him from getting baptized. And upon his request, they go down into the water, says Philip dips him in, and then when the eunuch comes out of the water, where's Philip? I, I would be freaking out, honestly, like, yeah, you guys saw him too, right? But he's, it says he goes on his way rejoicing. I don't know what that means. He's like clicking his heels or something, and he's just super excited that he now has a relationship with God, his creator. You know, I think that a few things we can learn here. One, he was not looking for a random stranger in the desert to come and bring the message to him. He went to Jerusalem, three month trip, three months back. I think he was expecting to find God in Jerusalem. But did he find the answers? No, a lot of us have very fixed ideas of how we want God to reveal answers to us. It's like, God, just, just speak to me, God. Just, just reveal it to me, God. And someone's like, hey, I'd like to tell you about the Bible. You're like, get away from me. I'm trying to listen to God right now. Reveal it in a dream, God. 
And then you read the Bible. The Bible tells you like word for word what you got to do. And you're like, I think I just got to meditate on this. I got to see if the spirit agrees with what the spirit wrote in the book that's for me. But I'm not really sure I want to do it. So I'm just going to say I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to say the spirit told me not to do what the spirit told me to do. Like, what's one thing that the Holy Spirit's never going to do? Contradict the Bible. And so we read the Bible. It's like, you got to repent. And you're like, ah, but I think the spirit's telling me that I should date this girl that I met online. And the spirit, maybe I can save her. I can save her. Like, God, this is my mission from God. Now I'm certain. I had a dream. And it's like, I didn't understand it in the moment. But now it's all clicking that maybe I can meet with this girl. Maybe we should move in together too. And I can show her like an example, a godly man. And then, and then that's going to be like, like, you're going to hell, dude. You are totally off base on this one. Why? Because you have now identified your own feelings and desires as the Holy Spirit. <laughs> How do you know what the Holy Spirit wants you to do? He wrote it down for you. So you can never get confused. It's in the Bible. And we have such fixed ideas about how we want God to reveal answers to us. What's God usually going to do? Just send you some guy. If you read the Bible, it's a story of people crying out for God, and God just sends them some guy. <laughs> and that guy gets to have visions from heaven. You don't get to have visions from heaven. Why? Because visions from heaven comes with a suffering and responsibility that you do not want. So they come. They take on that suffering for you. They give you the message. All you have to do is actually repent and obey the message. The other thing here is I think all this guy wanted was a relationship with God. You know, what's really cool about this guy is most historians and theologians believe that this man went back to Ethiopia and converted his entire country. Wow. So like a thousand years later, the European uh, imperialists come to Ethiopia and they're like going to like give them Christianity. And all the Ethiopians were like, oh, yeah, we already do this. Yep, we got churches. We got crosses. This is our, this is our thing, man. We're, we're Christian. And like this is like a huge like blank mystery in history for the longest time. Like, how is it possible? Like, how did Christianity get here? The only explanation was this guy. So this guy just wanted to have a relationship with God. God's plan for his life was so much bigger than that. I think a lot of us need to open up our minds to the idea that God wants to do a lot more with you than what you probably plan on doing. And God's going to do incredible things for you. Now, I think that God was only able to do this through him, though, because he was giving all of his heart. You know, I think two, and doesn't didn't make any excuses either. He had a lot of excuses to make. High powered job, way more important than any of us are doing. It's far away. This was expensive, but it, the, the, it's confusing. You can't understand the passage, but he gives his whole heart, makes no excuses, and God saves who knows how many souls through him. I think for a lot of us, we, we tend to take this scripture and point it out like non Christians. We say, Here, I got to help you out, man. You got to start reading your Bible every day, and you got to pray every day. They even got to come to church sometimes. And those are the big three. And we're like, that's the standard. And that's the standard we hold a non-Christian to when they're trying to become a Christian, right? Now, don't you think that as you grow in your faith, as you grow in your wisdom, as you grow in your conviction, the standard that you're held to should grow as well? And yet many of us, it's been one year, two years, three years, and you're still holding yourself to the same standard that you would give to a non-Christian. As long as I read my Bible every day and I pray every day and I come to church, I'm good, baby. Uh, full marks. I got an A plus on this one. That's an A plus for like a guy who's not saved. As a Christian, there's an expectation that you grow and you possess these qualities in increasing measure. I'm very encouraged by some disciples. I think Albert uh, is a great example of this principle. I met Albert maybe like six months ago. We sat down for a Bible study. He changed the location like three times right before it. And we, and we get to the Bible study. It's freezing. And like I'm trying to like teach him the Bible. He's kind of like making fun of me. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think I like this guy. Angel, I don't like this guy. You can do the studies with him. But Albert really wrestled in the Bible like really like work through these things. He's super smart. Sometimes when you're like a genius, it's kind of harder to get your head around like God is mightier than you. <laughs> but Albert humbled himself. He became a disciple. He got baptized like not that long ago. And he's like wearing a full suit. He, he's coming here. He, he also preached at midweek and like blew it out. It was ridiculous. And you look at that guy and he hasn't been a disciple for even a year, even half a year, I don't think. And yet he understands God's trying to use me. And I don't want to inhibit what God is trying to do by my own character deficit. I got to take care of that. I got to get knowledge in me. I got to get wisdom in me. I got to get conviction in me. Not so I can be a superhero or anything, but so that people can be saved. Because God is trying to use you for something greater. Imagine like a professional basketball player. And like he's like really good at basketball. And just someone comes up to him. He's like, I think you should focus on layups. Like maybe just do a few layup drills. I think that's a bit more your speed. Like wouldn't you be offended as a pro basketball player? 
I think you should be a little bit offended as a Christian if the standard for you is like, just read, just read a chapter a day, say a 15-minute prayer every day, and make sure you come to church every week as well. You should be like, I can do more than just layups, dude. Like, I, I, I got a little bit more in me. But imagine a player that just never ventures outside of that. I'm only going to shoot layups for the rest of my life, and I like layups, and layups are my thing. I feel comfortable with layups. Like, I don't think you actually are serious about making an impact on the team. I don't think you're really serious about becoming a player who can help us win games. At some point, you got to figure out, I, I got to learn how to preach. At some point, you got to figure out, I got to learn how I can teach the Bible to other people in an effective way. Not just like read a script like a car salesman, but I got to be able to get to the heart of people. At some point, it's time you start holding yourself to the standard. I need to develop. I need to grow. I need to be able to make an impact greater than the impact I'm making right now. Acts 17, we'll close out here in verse 26. It says, from one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. Isn't that pretty cool? From one man. All of us are from the same family. Black, white, anything else? We're family. <laughs> that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. As I said before, the ball is in your court. It will never be a question of, will God choose me? It's always going to be a question of, when will you choose God? Here it says he's not far from us. In fact, he's arranged all the different things in your life for the purpose. What does it say? That you might seek out for him and what? And, well, yeah, but before that, it says, perhaps reach out for him and find him because he's not far. The only question today, is are you going to seek after God? Are you going to make the most of the opportunity that God has given you? Or are you going to be like an ostrich and put your head back in the sand? And go back to building your own life, make as much money as possible, and have a status, and have a lot of followers, and get my 401k, and get my retirement, my career, I can be a homeowner, all these things. Or are you going to let God use your life today? I want to challenge you guys. If you know you're not a disciple, get serious about becoming a disciple. Start with the basics. Get in the layup line. Start reading your Bible every day. Pray every day and make it your conviction to be around a fellowship of believers. And if you consider yourself a disciple, it's time to stop holding God back with what he can do from you, with what he can do through you. Ask somebody, how can I mature? Hold me accountable because I want to make a great impact and help a lot of people have come to a relationship with God. For us today, the challenge is super simple. Expect more out of yourself. Be the person that God created you to be. Thank you. That's the lesson. Oh,